All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're in Revelation chapter 7 this morning, but I do have a little something I wanted to read to you. I don't know where I got it from, and I don't know, you may have all heard it, but I want to kind of read this little summary of life that I have here. Now, you have to pay kind of close attention so you can understand it. Summary of life. Great truths that little children have learned. So this is things little children have learned, okay? No matter how hard you try, you cannot baptize cats. When your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. If your sister hits you, don't hit her back. They always catch the second person. Never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato. <laughs> you can't trust dogs to watch your food. Don't sneeze when someone, someone is cutting your hair. And never hold a dustbuster and a cat at the same time. You can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. The best place to be when you're sad is in grandpa's lap. Aww. Now, great truths that adults have learned. Raising teenagers is like nailing jello to a tree. Wrinkles don't hurt. You guys don't know that yet. You ever done that when you're younger? You look at somebody have wrinkles, go, wow, I wonder if they hurt. They, they don't hurt. <laughs> Laughing is good exercise. It's like jogging on the inside. Yeah. Middle age is when you choose your cereal for the fiber, not for the toy. <laughs> now, great truths about growing old. Growing old is mandatory. Growing up is optional. Forget the health food, I need all the preservatives I can get. <laughs> That's a good one. When you fall down, you wonder what else you can do while you're down there. Oh, the old people laughing now. You're getting old when the same sensation from a rocking chair is the one you once got from a roller coaster. It's frustrating when you know all the answers, but nobody bothers to ask you the questions. <laughs> Time may be a healer, but it's a lousy beautician. <laughs> Wisdom comes with age, but sometimes age comes all alone. The four stages of life. First stage, you believe in Santa Claus. Second stage, you don't believe in Santa Claus. Third stage, you are Santa Claus. Fourth stage, you look like Santa Claus. <laughs> success. At age four, success is not peeing in your pants. At age 12, success is having friends. At age 17, some places, is success is having a driver's license. At age 35, success is having money. At age 50, success is having money. At age 70, success is having a driver's license. At age 75, success is having friends. At age 80, success is not peeing in your pants. <laughs> and we need a little, little laughter, a little joy once in a while in our heart, a little humor, especially when you're going through Revelation. You know, we're in Revelation, and man, we're just looking at the tribulation on the earth that's going to happen here. The last seven years of earth, we know it. And, you know, it's pretty heavy stuff going on here. So get a little joy before we get into it. Now, to me, Revelation is exciting. But for some, the revelation can be scary. It really depends on, you know, where your standing is with the Lord. But it's exciting for us because we are going to be with Jesus in heaven. That's exciting. The downfall is those that we know that don't know Jesus are going to be down here going through this tribulation on the earth. That's the downside. That's scary. We, we know, the, God, you know what? God himself, the Lord Jesus, does not want anybody to go through the tribulation. He wished that all would be saved. But it's man's choice. And so when we read Revelation, we see these horrendous things that are going to happen to the earth. And we can't blame God. It's a judgment on the earth that's coming, it's due. Uh, it's, it's what Satan has done to the earth and what man in his sin has done. And the judgment is coming. People are going to be crushed. There's going to be suffering. It's not going to be fun. Okay. So we've seen so far 
The first six seals open up on this scroll, which is the title deed of planet Earth that only Jesus could open up. And every time a seal was broken, a, a catastrophe happened here on the Earth. And that's what we've looked at uh, so far. We've seen the Antichrist, His coming. We've seen the false peace that He brings. And then we see war that comes and famine and pestilence and death. Judgments are coming. But most of these things are happening because of the direction man chooses to go in himself. The things that we choose to do. We usually suffer the consequences of our sin. You know, it's not God causing those things. It's the consequences of our sin. For instance, if I, uh, you know, I thank God that He delivered me from smoking cigarettes. But you know, if I continue smoking cigarettes from 16 years old up until now, there's a good possibility I could get cancer. I know for sure I would be coughing a lot because I was 35 years old. I was coughing my head off. People would say, oh, you got a cold? No. I had a smoker's cough. Now, did, that's the consequences of my sin of smoking. Is that God's fault? No. And, and so, you know, we have to look at it in that way. We see that during the, those seals broken, we see the people hiding from God and, and from Jesus. And from the wrath of the Lamb, they say, they're hiding. They get in caves and say, hide us rocks from God. I mean, come on now. You can't hide from God. We know that. The wrath of the Lamb that is to come. It says in Revelation 6.16, which is the back of chapter that we're looking at. It says, and he said to the mountains, and the people said to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? But it says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9 through 11 says, <coughs> excuse me, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also doing. See, God has not appointed you and I for wrath. Matter of fact, He delivers us from it and He'll never pour His wrath out on us. I believe, as I've shared with you many times, we will not be here. We'll be watching from ringside seats in heaven all these events that are going on down here. Uh, we are gone. In Revelation 5, uh, verse 8 through 10, there's a song they sing. Let me read it to you. Now, when Jesus had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. It's the song of salvation. It's the song of redemption. And there's only a certain people that can sing that song. And who is that? That's you and I, the bride of Christ, believers in Jesus. And where are they when they sing the song? They are in heaven, around the throne, singing this song while the tribulation is going on in the earth. That's you and I there. So, you know, that's just one of those scriptures that comfort me with the thought I'm not have to go through all this junk that's going to happen down here. Now, there are four groups standing uh, in heaven during this tribulation time. Four groups. The first one is us, the church. We are standing before God. And the second one, we're going to look at right now in Revelation 7, verse 1. After this, after the first seals have been broken and after uh, these things that happened, it says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow or the earth, on the earth or the sea or on any tree. You know, four corners of the earth, that's just a saying. That doesn't literally mean... I mean people take this and say, See, the Bible is wrong. It says there's four corners and it's round. You know, people, it, this is just a it's, a... it's a saying we've said for years. You know, it's something, hey, the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds. Now, the winds, when you look at it in the Bible, they speak of judgment. Judgment coming when you, when you, there's many scriptures, I didn't write them all down, I'm going to just read one to you, uh, that deal with wind 
and judgment coming. And this one that I'm going to read to you is in Jeremiah 49, 36. It says, God speaking, And against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcast of Elam will not go up. So, so the four winds, what he's holding back is these four angels are holding back the judgments that are coming to the earth. Now the earth isn't, you know, there's not all these people on the earth looking and they're looking at one corner and there's an angel standing there going, holding back a wind. You know, they can't see. These are spiritual things that John has seen in the spirit. You know, right around you and I right now is a spiritual realm that we don't see and there's angels all around i mean it's where jesus is with us we don't see him but we know he's here god is everywhere it's a spiritual realm that we don't see and those are the things that john and you and i will be seeing will be seeing the spiritual things when we're in heaven we don't see them now but we will so a lot of things don't make sense to us and we don't understand but you know what one day when we're there we will understand these things so in verse 2 and 3 of chapter 7 it says and I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. So there's this other angel that in, he gets the orders, you know, nothing's going to happen until my people are taken care of, until my people are sealed. So everything's going to be held back until his people are sealed. You know, <clears throat> these people that are going to be sealed aren't us. Why would he have to seal us when we're already sealed with the Holy Spirit? Let me read some scripture to you. This cannot be the church. One of the things is, these are going to be servants of His. It says in John 15, 15, it says, No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus calls you His friend. No longer a servant, but His friend. Yes, we will serve Him, but we're not His servant. We're His friend. I, I like that. That one song we sing, you know, you are my... You, you, you're, um, you're not my, you're my brother and you're my friend. You know, we sing, I love that song. I love that line. Because he's my friend. And he says it in the word. Jesus is our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Now we've seen this seal thing happen before. In Ephesians 1.13 it says, In him, that's Jesus you have trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you believe in Jesus, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He came and lives in you. He seals you for eternity. The seal is saying, you and I belong to Him. Nobody's going to take us away from Him. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Wow. You know, years ago, years and years ago, loggers... They would, go, uh, they would go into a forest and they would cut down logs and then they would take their seal, their wax seal, and they wrap around something around it and they would seal it. So when they took the logs into their village or their city, their seal was on. It belonged to them. It was their logs. They would belong to nobody else. You know, I remember in the cowboy days, I probably still do, where they brand their cattle so they go, that's my cattle. What a terrible thing to do. But... but they branded their cattle. They sealed their cattle so everybody knew it. So when somebody stole the cattle or a thief, they would see, see this symbol of the ranch next door. And hey, they knew it was stolen. It belonged to them. Okay? Now Jesus, He bought us. He paid for us. It says this in Ezekiel 9, verse 3 and 4. It says, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been, to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the rider's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it. So even in the Old Testament, God would have certain people sealed, and then the rest of the people would suffer the judgment. Remember the seal that happened during uh, Passover? And the seal was the blood on the door. 
the blood on the lentils and the sides of the door. And every home that had that, the, the Lord passed over and nobody was killed in it. The firstborn wasn't killed in that. So, so sealing is something that we see quite a bit in the Bible. Now, his own were sealed, the rest were judged. The, and I, uh, it's interesting there how they put the mark on their forehead. You know, we're going to look at the future. Somebody else is going to put a mark on somebody's forehead or on the back of their hand. It's going to be the Antichrist. You know, he always copies everything. You know, he tries to copy things, pretend like he's the Lord. So, now, the ones he's going to seal in verse 4 through 8. Okay, here we go. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. You ever heard that number before? 144,000? Hmm. Well, verse 5 says, <clears throat> From the tribes of sons of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. 12, from the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Nephalti, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. I want you to notice something here. That 144,000 were sealed from the tribes of Israel. They were not Gentiles. They were from each tribe of Israel, this 144,000. And you know what? And when they're sealed, and they go, and the tribulation happens, and all this bad stuff is happening, you know what? He does not let one of them go. He is with them. They are sealed. They are not going to suffer his judgments. So they're going to see it. They're going to be part of it, but they're not going to die. For it. Because listen, in Revelation 14, 1, says this. John, John says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb, that's Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Not 143,999. All 144,000 standing with Jesus on the mountain. God sees the mark. Spiritual beings will see the mark. And they are protected. And you and I, you and I are marked, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit in our life. The same God that protects those people protects you and I. He seals us. Things happen in our life. And God uses those things. But nothing can happen without His permission. I don't like that sometimes, but you know what? I accept it. Because I trust my God. I believe my God. Now, so this is the third group who stands during the tribulation. These 144,000 standing with Jesus. Who can stand? His people can stand. They're not hiding under the rocks. They can stand. But we have many, many groups through history, <clears throat> history and today who claim to be the 144,000. A lot of different types of religious groups come along and say, we're the 144,000. I don't know how, if they're not Jewish and not part of those tribes, I don't know how they can say that because my Bible is very clear. You know, I'm not going to uh, stray from that at all. And let me just name some of them. Obviously, you know one of them is the Je Jehovah's Witnesses. Say they're the 144,000. You know, in the 1800s, whenever they all started up and stuff, that was cool. But, you know, in the early 1900s, they passed 144,000. There was only going to be 144,000 going to heaven. That's what they were saying. Well, once they pass 144,000, what do you do? What if you're 144,001? You missed the boat. 144,002. Well, they just changed their rules. Oh, it's simple. We'll change the rules. The 144,000 are just the special ones. They are our elite. And then the rest of us will be okay too. You know, God's Bible doesn't change. His word doesn't change. It was a false prophecy. It was a, they're false prophets. They aren't even Christians. Uh, so it's false. Then you got the historical Mormons. They originally thought they were the 144,000 also. And then when they reached a certain number, they changed their rules. 
the children of God. When I was back in my hippie days, when Miss Ann and I were young, and, the, and many different kinds of movements were starting, and there was this one movement called the children of God. And that now they're, they're not so much in the States, but they're in Southeast Asia, and they're in Europe and places like that. They say they're the 144,000. Ellen G. White. Does anybody know who Ellen G. White is? Ellen G. White started which religion? Seventh-day Adventist. Her original writings, in her original writings, she wrote about her followers being the 144,000. I did facts, okay? I'm not... I'm just gonna, that was how it started out, okay? The Worldwide Church of God. You ever heard of that one? Garner, Ted, Armstrong. That's, that's another one. Uh, his group in Texas, they claimed to be the 144,000. Then they had a split, and part of that group broke off and got more biblically sound. But the original group still believes they're the 144,000. Okay. Now, once again, I, I share with you, you, I read it. If you had a Bible there, you follow along with me. It says it's Jews. It's from the tribes of Israel. It's not Gentiles and people that, you know, for some reason say they are. That, that, that's, that's, those are. That's false. That's not truth. He lists them right there. I think that's why he did it too. He knew in the end days we'd have all these religions come along saying they're 144,000. So he lists every tribe and how many from each tribe, okay? But there's something even deeper in this. Spiritually deeper. Going deeper. Today and through history, people, even the church, have tried to get rid of God's people, the Jews, Israelites. Even the church has tried to get rid of them. Tried, tried to get them out of the equation. Okay, I'm going to share with you some of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about here. There's a thing called replacement theology. Where the church has replaced the Jews as God's people, okay? Just to simplify. The church has replaced the Jews as God's people. It's replacement theology. There's another one that came out years ago called Kingdom Now. And Kingdom Now says, When the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, God is no longer working through the Jews or any plans for the Jews. And all the promises made to Israel have been forfeited and passed on to the church kingdom now and they're going to usher in the kingdom now okay i have friends that are into this uh some denominations are into this they say that the church is setting the stage to bring jesus back and there really isn't going to be a thousand millennium that's just kind of uh one of those things that's in the word isn't really it's not really going to happen like it says in the bible but we the church are going to be upright and we're going to usher in the kingdom because it's here now. And you know, the, I got some problems with that because I don't know where the line is where the church, you know, how we get holy enough because that's the part of it is we, we are going to be so holy and so righteous and turn things around so much that the kingdom is going to come in now. Jesus, we're going to usher Jesus back. You know what? You got to get rid of me because I still sin. Every time I thought I was, had finally arrived and I was holy enough, man, I fell on my face. Kabam! Every time something big in my life, like I remember when I, I didn't smoke anymore, like, yes, I've arrived! I don't smoke anymore! Yay! You know, and I thought, man, I'm super Christian now. You know what I'm saying? And what happened to me? Bam! Fall on my face. Some stupid thought. Anger. Some, some, and then I saw my heart. So, oh, wait a minute. My heart's worse than... The smoking and the drugs and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a worse condition. So, you know, it, that's not going to happen. And that's not what the Bible says. You know, this actually started when the, the church uh, got legalized when Constantine was emperor in 300 AD. We, we talked about that and looked at that uh, when we were in the, the letters earlier on. When the church started and Constantine all of a sudden made it legal to be a Christian. Before that, remember, they were throwing them to the lions, skinning them. I mean, making torches out of them and, you know, I mean, they were doing all kinds of things to Christians. And all of a sudden, it's legal to be a Christian, but the Christians have Jesus as their God. So they had a little bit of a problem with Constantine being emperor. They had to be careful that they didn't offend him. So they started bringing in this theology uh, that, that 
they changed things up a bit so that he wouldn't feel offended. And so they, they took the Jews out of the equation. They try, tried to say the Jews no longer, you know, were going, you know, once, once the Gentiles became Christians, the Jews were no longer part of God's kingdom. St. Augustine, you guys know who St. Augustine is? He preached this. Martin Luther was a big part of this. Martin Luther was a godly man. He did great things. I mean, he, you know, he brought us into uh, uh, Protestantism where, you know, we're, we're, it broke off from the Catholic Church to where we could worship God and read the Bible and, you know, change things around a lot like that. But he was wrong in one area, and that was this. He hated and he cursed the Jews. You know, my Bible says you don't do that. He put them down. Said they were Christ killers. Did you know he had a huge influence on Hitler? Huge influence on Hitler. Hitler took that and ran with it. Now through all this persecution and all these things and how people have turned against the Jews, all these things that have happened, God uses that to draw his people back to himself. And another problem that I have with this is if we say, okay, we took the place and all the promises are for us that the Jews had. I don't know who King David is going to sit on his throne, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, but the problem I have with that is if God, to me, then that means God breaks his promises to his people. And if he can break them to them, guess where else he can break them? To us. And, oh, and God doesn't. God promised his people certain things and he's going to fulfill them whether they turn against him or not whether they crucified him or not he is faithful to them whether they are faithful to him or not and they have not been faithful to him Israel has not been faithful to God that's why he went outside and the church was born because of that in Romans 11 if you, if, if you want to just I'm not, you don't have to turn there but you take it yourself go study Romans 11 and you'll see that God is not done with the Jews yet Romans 11 is all about that he is not done with them he loves the Jews he loves them unconditionally and I thank him that he does because that means he loves you and I the same way and he's not going to break his promises to you and I so here we have these 144,000 that are sealed by God. We're going to see what they're going to do. What they are, these 144,000 are kind of like, you guys know who Billy Graham is? Billy Graham, the evangelist. These are going to be like 144,000 Billy Grahams running around evangelizing the world. And the enemy can't touch them because they're sealed. I think that's going to be, I'm going to love watching that. Just watching what's going on down here. When the enemy's trying to get rid of these people, trying to kill these people, and how God's just going to work and keep them, keep them safe. You know, it's going to be just how he does to you and I. Many times, many of us probably should have been dead many times and somehow God got us through. Times we don't even know about. We probably could have been killed and God has saved us. Because he watches out for us. So he's going to watch out and we're going to watch him take care of these guys. 144,000. You know, around the year 2000, somewhere right in there, there was 48,000 full-time missionaries on the field in the world. That's not very many, really. There's going to be 144,000 of these guys running around like Billy Graham, evangelizing during the tribulation. And because of that, I believe there will be many, many people that are, are going to be saved. A lot of people that will be saved. <clears throat> so... We're going to stop there because the next part we go too long. Take us, take us into lunch. So we'll leave it right there with these 144,000 from the tribes. And, and so now those of you that have friends that, that are part of some of these other religions, just read that to them. I don't, I don't know how they, anybody can get around that unless they are Jewish themselves or something. I, I don't know how they can get around uh, what it says in the Word. And you, and, and you don't go to them and, you, and put them down and you don't tell them you're wrong. You don't yell at them. You don't love them. But you know what? When I'm talking with people that are in cults and different things that are misled, you know, I don't yell at them. I usually ask them questions. Well, what, what about this? What about that? What does this mean? What does that mean? 
and then, then I can hear where they're coming from. And if I know my Bible well enough, I'll have an answer for them. You say, well, you know, the Bible says this. Now you run into a little bit of a problem when they change their Bible, which they did. But there are, are places where they didn't change it, and, and then they can't get around those scriptures. So, so here we are. Next week, we're going to look at another group, the next group that's going to be standing in heaven. It's going to be the rest of this chapter. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's going to be those who are killed during the tribulation, and now they're up around the throne of God. So we're going to look at them next week. So let's pray.